So this is a paper very much thinking about how to put in industrial organization back into models of trade where we start thinking about agricultural trade as well. So it's joint work with Silvana Tendrero, who you might know is on the Monetary Policy Commission uh, Committee at the moment of the Bank of England, so won't be able to be with us today. But what I'm going to talk about is just give you a very broad overview. I know it's a 30 minute talk, so I'm not going to get into really deep, deep details, but I'll try to give you an idea of what the model is and what the empirics do, do, do as well. Next slide, please. So there's a large theoretical and empirical literature, of course, that this, you know, this audience knows very well and really focused on thinking about what the gains from trade are in terms of the aggregate, as well as in terms of the distributional of impacts of the gains from trade, the division of these gains from trade. Most of it, though, has really focused typically on manufactured goods or sometimes now on services, but not thinking very clearly about what, what the issues in agricultural trade are. And one of the reasons we should care about agriculture trade is that it's a large employer, it's a key source of livelihood in small developing economies, as well as for many lower income households across the world. Agricultural markets, mostly in international trade, we think of them as the Rausch homogeneous good, you know, and we're thinking much more in terms of that these are perfectly competitive products. But of course, that's true maybe in world commodities markets, but not necessarily when the point of access that the farmer has to these markets, to crop markets. So we're really going to focus, think very carefully about farmers who sell through intermediaries. They're not going to have direct access to world markets. And it's that component, the fact that they don't have direct access to world markets that creates this behind the border barrier to trade their ability to access world markets. Next slide, please. And what I'm going to turn to sort of very um, much is focus on intermediation. Typically, when people have thought about intermediation in most settings, it's really thinking very much about the consumption side gains from intermediation or the consumption side losses from intermediation. But at least for low income households, what is likely to be much more important is the income side because they don't consume so much of imported consumption goods that the income side is where intermediation and access to world markets is gonna become really sort of important. And what has happened since at least the 1980s is this massive, diff massive change in how agriculture, agribusinesses operate in developing economies. So after market reforms happened, there was a decline in the importance of state companies that buy from farmers and much more sort of open access for private businesses to operate in these markets. And what is happening much more recently, since about the 2000s at least, is that this is not just about small traders going and buying from farmers going, and those are what determines the farm gate prices. They're big agribusinesses that now operate across developing economies. And a lot of developing countries, even today, have the idea of, have, of getting agribusiness-led development of crop markets is really key on the policymakers agenda. So just to give you some examples, in Ghana, some particular you know, tracts of land have been particularly targeted for export crops and for commercialization of agriculture. So and there are many other settings, and I'm going to show you the case which we're going to look at in more detail, which is the Kenya case. So trade liberalization, when this happened and when these market reforms took place, what most people expected would happen would be a massive increase in living standards in developing economies, something that would help in mitigating poverty. But and one reason people thought that would happen would be that these agribusinesses typically have much higher productivity and they have much better access to world markets and that would provide a way for farmers to be able to also access these markets. But there were others who at the same time also thought that, there would, that these are firms that have a lot of bargaining power relative to the farmers that they interact with. And that's possibly going to lead to a very dualistic structure of the rural economy that you have a bunch of farmers, really sort of big farmers who operate agribusinesses, and then you have the rest of the economy, which is really sort of selling much more sort of non-export crops and or possibly not getting quite the same worth that they should. So this is an open question. There's it's it's a very, very controversial debate. And you know, I am is not to sort of get into that debate and try and sort of pick apart what, what is right and what isn't right. We're gonna look at a very specific case and see whether we can do something about trying to inform this debate about where the productivity gains might come from, as well as where the possible losses might arise from. And what I'm gonna focus on are behind the border barriers to trade, which in principle, for those of us who are familiar with international trade in general, these are what sort of, you know, the handbook of commercial policy is gonna say that 
there's the, your usual trade barriers, tariffs that we're very used to thinking about. Then there are these non-tariff barriers which operate, which we don't really know how to quantify very well. And then there are also these behind the border barriers to trade, which need not even exist in the border. And they exist sort of internally within domestic markets and make it unlikely for those agents to be able to access world markets. That's really what we're going to focus on. And we're going to ask the question that when there was a reduction in these behind the border barriers to trade, what happened to farmer incomes? What happened to agribusiness profits? Any questions? Next slide, please. Okay, so let me summarize what the approach is and what the findings will be. And then we'll get, I'll show you much more detail about how we do this. So we're gonna try and sort of carefully model the industrial organization of agricultural markets, which is to say that there are sort of, um, farmers don't necessarily be, sell directly. They have to go through intermediaries and we wanna take the market power of intermediaries seriously. And this is going to generate, and because we're going to sort of build in both channels, that there's going to be a productivity in impact of dealing of going to big agribusinesses, but there's also possibly going to be a, an increase in market power that comes because they're much bigger and have much bigger fixed investments. So we're going to look at both of those channels and then say that in principle, theoretically, either of these two things can happen, that farmers would actually gain a lot from a behind the border barrier reduction, or you can also see cases where they may not gain. So we're gonna take that to the data, mainly to think about a national level policy change that happened in Kenya. It was a fairly sweeping change in the sense that quite radically and quite quickly within a couple of years, policies were put in place to encourage agribusiness led development. So while previously a lot of licensing was needed, a lot of investment constraints existed on who could come and invest in Kenya and be able to buy from farmers, many of those were relaxed. I'm gonna show you very specific examples of that. So I'll you know, postpone that discussion for a little bit later. And what we find is that when you look at what these behind the border barriers were and you systematically look across crops and then boil it down to what that meant in terms of household incomes, overall what we find is that there was a substantial increase in profits for agribusinesses during this time period. And at the same, it was accompanied also by a loss in incomes for farmers that specialized in selling these behind the border crops to agribusinesses. So the, the losses were really concentrated amongst farmers who were specializing in these crops and who also sold through agribusinesses. And if we look at how much income loss was, farm incomes around this time period during the pre-period and the post-period that we look at fell by about 6% as a result of this uh, reduction in behind the border barriers to trade. But what is sort of the, one of the key contributions of the paper will be to be able to provide some level of theory and evidence for behind the border barriers, which has even been very difficult to do in sort of, you know, conventional settings where we have access to really fine product level data, like developed country industrial markets, even there, we have very, very few cases where there's actually big systematic evidence to be able to understand what behind the border barriers do to uh, division of gains from trade. Next slide, please. So I'll skip this and I'll move on to the next slide, please. So this is broadly to tell you that, yes, there's a huge literature. Nobody's been citing them till now. There's lots and lots of citations in the paper. I'm not trying to gloss over these, but broadly, the main point is we're going to try and marry theory and empirics in a way that can actually go from being from having a fairly general set of theoretical predictions to being able to actually implement them empirically. So that's what I'm going to start with. I'm going to start with showing you a couple of stylized facts, which are going to be embedded into the theory then. And after that, I'm going to show you what the key components of the theory are. I'm not going to get into very much detail about this because it's going to become a little bit more far too much for a 30 minute talk. And then I'll talk about the empirical application and conclude after that. Next slide, please. So next slide. Great. Thanks. So the first fact is that um, most farmers in developing economies don't really sell to consumers directly. So in our case, if you look at the first column in there, 20% is roughly what's going to directly to consumers from these farmers. And about 15% now goes to 14 to 15% goes to agribusinesses. Now, what do I mean by agribusinesses? These are typically what the LSMS will classify as large companies. And what in our data, when we look at the Kenyan data, we have it much more sort of um, narrowly given. So you get to see whether it's a miller, processor, some kind of large firm, is it a supermarket that they're selling to? Is it an exporter? So on and so forth. And we're kind of clubbing them all together and calling that agribusiness just so that we can get a handle on what's going on. If you also want to get a sense of how these numbers are changing over time. So Kenya already had a fair presence of agribusinesses in 2000. And by the time we see the end of our sample, which is 2010, 
we find that the number has gone up to about 40%. And one of the key reasons, of course, is that in 2004 was when, um, roughly in the middle of 2004, is when the policy was put in place to encourage agribusiness-led development of crop markets. So I shouldn't put a plug here for Mike War. I really appreciated what he said yesterday in the discussion. It, it was a hell of a lot of effort to get these LSMS data sets together. So it would be absolutely great if people were to share these things together and it would help a lot in terms of getting consolidating all of this together. So next slide, please. So the second fact that I wanna mention, so it's not just that farmers don't access world markets directly and they go through intermediaries, but also that the ones who go through agribusinesses tend to look different from the ones who sell to other buyers. So again, in trade, we're very used to thinking about these things, which is, you know, there is a multinational premium attached uh, there, and there is an exporter premium. And similarly, farmers who sell through agribusinesses have an income premium and an acreage premium. So these tend to be larger farmers, these tend to be richer farmers. And that's sort of, again, fairly consistently true across these different countries. Next slide, please. So I'm going to take those two facts. So Ati, sorry, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt. Uh, there is a clarification question from uh, two yeah. slides I, ago. I, um, you know, in the slide where you were showing the shares, uh, I think slide eight, uh, mm -hmm. Doug Golling was asking, is this across all commodities? And um, presumably this omits yeah. home consumed goods, which in some sense are being sold to the producers themselves. Exactly. So this is actually, this is not taking out, um, uh, this is only taking sales which are going to the market. So you're perfectly right. This isn't including the produce own consumption. And that's something which we played with a lot earlier, but I haven't done that now. So that's definitely something we can look into for the, sort of the later part that you'll see. Okay. Great, thanks. So on the theory, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, put together a model which is fairly straightforward. It has all of the usual characteristics that we put in, but now we're gonna think of actual monopsonistic buyers who are buying from these farmers. So first big simplification is gonna be that we're gonna think, think of a small open economy where world prices are given. So this is, you know, we're, we're typically thinking of, we're gonna be thinking of sort of smaller uh, developing countries here. There's gonna be a unit measure of identical farmers, each with a unit of land. There's nothing sort of lost if you wanted to think of these as being not a unit measure of identical farmers, but as there being some kind of idiosyncratic productivity about farmers. But broadly, what is going to be important is that we're going to think of farmers as not having direct access to world crop markets, and they must sell through intermediaries to be able to access world markets. The farmers are going to choose crops. There's going to be a choice between two crops, and they're going to choose between intermediaries. So you could sell to just a normal trader, or you could possibly sell to an agribusiness. And what's going to be fundamental for the farm question, and this is a broad, a very sort of a simplification that we only want to think about their farm earnings. So for right now, we're just putting the consumption good as a linear utility over a consumption good. So you're maximizing farm earnings, which is also sort of getting to the, to what Doug was saying earlier, that maybe we should also think more carefully about subsistence. The next thing we're going to look at is, um, the next sort of main feature is going to be that these intermediaries are going to be cool knowledge opsonists that maximize profits conditional on entry. And when it comes to entry, what makes traders and agribusinesses different here, why there are these two different kinds of intermediaries, is that agribusinesses also provide some extra service to farmers, which increases their farm output, the value of their farm output. And when they do that, they need to be able to make some kind of procurement and marketing investments, which raise farm marketing productivity. So these are agribusinesses who tend to be, who will be more productive exposed and who also will be making these big fixed investments. And then finally, we're going to close the model by resource clearing of, non of a non-tradable factor, very much along the line of the discussion yesterday, that there are sort of other scarce resources in these economies. And it's not just about the sort of supply elasticity of the particular farm factor that you're looking at. So in that sense, th this is what's going to sort of be the broad outline of the model. Next slide, please. And what I'm going to sort of lay in now is show you first the farmer side, then explain more carefully what intermediary pricing and competition looks like, and then talk about the entry decision and how that feeds into what we think of as the impacts of it, reducing entry barriers on farmer incomes. So the first thing is going to be that farmers are going to choose between two crops. They can grow either crop one or crop two. 
I should come up with better names, I know, but for right now, this is what it is. We're so used to thinking of crop one and two in trade that, and I'm gonna think of crop two as just being normalized to a productivity of one. So every, all of the action that we're thinking of in terms of intermediaries is gonna happen on crop one. The main reason for doing this is because that's actually the way we're gonna organize the data later as well. So farmers are gonna receive a productivity draw and compared to the sort of presentation yesterday, this is exactly what that is, that this is a comparative advantage draw that you're getting from a distribution, which looks Pareto. So once you've seen your productivity draw, you can then decide what you wanna do, or you could have thought of these as identical farmers and then there's some idiosyncratic productivity. What's gonna be cru crucial here is this fee min term. So what is fee min? It's telling you what is the lowest productivity that anybody in a particular sort of any of these farmers have, and that's gonna be one of the features which then will determine in our case, who, which areas have comparative advantage. I'll talk more about that later. So how do farmers decide which crops and intermediaries to choose? They're gonna to want to maximize farm earnings. And if you choose just crop two, you'll get some price P2. If you choose crop one, there's an additional productivity advantage that you're getting. So you're getting the price P1, as well as the multiplied by that productivity increase that's happening. And then the third thing would be if suppose you decide to also decide not just to go to the intermediary, but also to make avail of these agribusiness services, then we're going to assume that for every step of the agribusiness service that you take, that's going to basically give you a bit of a price premium. But if you want to be able to enjoy this price premium to get this productivity boost, you also need to make some level of investments. And this is again very similar to what we're used to in trade that the fixed costs are going to generate size differences and this is what's going to give us also selection into agri sales to ag selling to agribusiness that large farmers are the ones who are going to be able to you know afford these fixed investments and to be able to sell to agribusinesses i want to point out one thing which is going to show up later again which is what this term k is so k is basically picking up it's, it's a Pareto shape parameter, which picks up a rise in the Gini index of relative land productivity. And that's gonna show up in our pricing equation. Next slide, please. I know I'm going too slow, so I should speed up. Well, what's gonna happen? Two key um, results. The first so piece- just, so, yeah. Sorry, yeah, just uh, the, you have 10 minutes left now. Okay. Yeah, okay. perfect. So I'm gonna now run through everything, okay. So what does it mean? The first thing I'm gonna show you is that the highest productivity firm, uh, farmers are the ones who are gonna be able to grow crop one and sell to agribusinesses. The medium productivity ones are gonna grow crop one, uh, but they won't be able to sell to agribusinesses and the lowest productivity ones are gonna be able to grow crop two and they're not gonna get into the crop one market. In terms of what prices they get, that's gonna fundamentally depend on how many intermediaries there are. So P1, the price that you get from an intermediary depends on how many intermediaries there are, which is N, the number of intermediaries, the mass of intermediaries in that market. And of course, it also increases with the world price. The second part is telling you that there's a price premium that you will get depending on how much competition there is amongst different agribusinesses, which is MA, the measure of agribusinesses. And it'll give you, it'll of course change with what the world prices are as well. Next slide, please. So now what I'm gonna say is close the model. I'm not gonna get into too much detail here. So agribusinesses enter till profits are driven down to zero. Resource clearing happens for that scarce resource. And what we end up with is farm incomes, which I'm gonna now start asking the question that suppose there was a reduction in the fixed cost of entering agribusiness services or in the fixed costs of just generally entry of intermediaries, what is going to be the impact on farm incomes? And the key result from the paper would be that there are going to be two effects. One is a direct effect that, yes, you've reduced entry barriers. There's going to be more competition. Farmers are going to end up with higher prices. But at the same time, because resource competition has increased as well, just like in a Millet's model, you're seeing higher investments happen. And therefore, the, the second impact would be that it, resource competition shifts, skews resources towards big agribusinesses. And that, in turn, can possibly reduce the price, reduce the incomes that farmers are getting. What is gonna be fundamental though, is that the magnitudes of these changes of how much farm incomes change depend crucially on whether you actually, <clears throat> the, big, the magnitude of these changes are gonna be higher in comparative advantage areas for the reason in, that in though, if, you, if you are in a high female, say village, you're going to be able to, you're going to be growing much more of these crops 
and you're going to be much more dependent on them in the sense that there aren't many other viable options and therefore your impacts are going to be much bigger. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to go through the empirical application. Next slide. And what we're, what we're going to do is estimate changes in farm incomes on these changes in behind the border barriers that happen. The C denotes crops. A denotes the stage of agribusiness activity, which could be exporting, marketing, business, uh, buying. The comparative advantage of the village interacted with whether you originally sold to an agribusiness or not, because that's what the model would say, that the incumbent farmers who sell already to agribusinesses may look very different from the ones who now start to enter or exit agribusiness services. So next slide, please. I'm going to skip over this to show you directly what happened. Next slide, please. So here's what, how we're going to code up these behind the border barriers to trade. So what was the broad story that went on? A new government came into power in 2002 and, then, and very much on the platform of we want to do something for agriculture. But some say that primarily probably to undermine the previous uh, policy agenda. But what, what this ended up doing was that this is actually the National Cereals and Produce Board Act of Kenya, which was passed in 2004. And certain sections, as you can see, under 18.1, deleted by Act Number 10 of 2006. Next slide, please. And what does this act, what does this deletion entail? This is basically saying that the person who needed to get a license for export of maize or other similar produce, which is listed in this act, those are going to be removed from the legal text. So basically it's a section of legislation which typically will correspond to one license, which is being removed. Next slide, please. And we can construct all of these crop level behind the border barrier measures. We can also weight them by the potential yield of the of different villages across these different crops. And we end up with sort of a behind the border barrier measure of trade. Next slide, please. And if you and just to give you a broad idea, what are these, what is this measure correlated with? If we look at it at the crop level, it doesn't seem to be correlated with world prices, with change in world prices, other measures of distortions that people have looked at. So what I'm going to now focus on is first tell you that yes, the the policy worked in the sense that it was designed to create to have agribusiness led development. And we do see that there is an increase in market share of farmers who sell to agribusinesses. So more of their uh, more farmers are now selling to agribusinesses in, in, sec in crops which were basically liberalized at this point. So BTB equal to zero means there's no, ch no license change in those crops. BTB equals to one means there was some change and then there's a whole range which goes greater than one. Next slide, please. So now what this is doing is this is saying, let's look at the farmer. We know, the sh the co we know whether the farmer is in a comparative advantage village or not. So we can share weight all of those different behind the bottom measures that have changed. And we can weight that by the potential yield that would have happened. So that gives us an individual a village specific shock to the economy, which is what was the reduction in behind the border barriers during for you if you were in a village that was higher comparative advantage versus lower comparative advantage. What we see is, you know, there wasn't sort of that transformative increase in income that happened. So this is the income of the farmer from farming in thousand Kenyan shillings on the left hand side and on the right hand side is our measure of behind the border barrier reductions. And that gives us then pretty much nothing if you look at the average effect, but if you break it down by who the incumbent farmers selling to agribusinesses were versus others, then you see a 22 Kenyan shilling reduction, again in thousands. Next slide, please. And we can do this for not just incomes, but also take out some of the farm input costs that happen. Maybe there's some kind of selling, um, cross sharing of input costs that's happening, and that doesn't seem to matter. You can also try and control for what's that have fallen prices. Was this the case that it just happened to be really distorted products in which the behind the border reduction happened and that's what's driving everything. You can do various things like these, and it turns out that the coefficient doesn't move in any very big way, so it doesn't look like there's sort of confounding factors. Next slide, please. So if you want to interpret these numbers earlier, what, is, what this is amounting to is a 6% drop in incomes, farm incomes on average, as a result of this behind the border reduction. We can also look at sort of the channels more carefully, which is to say, are we really seeing effects where we should? So if we can look at just the in sales that go to agribusinesses, 
we can look within household crops. Next slide, please. And we find that generally it's the farmers who are selling to agribusinesses who are impacted. And they tend to be more impacted than say, somebody who hasn't sold to an agribusiness. You see a very, very tiny negative effect there. So what I want to show now in the next couple of minutes when I end is that this is kind of one side of the transaction. You can look at the sort of trans meta transaction on the firm side, and this is what this slide does, that we look at a share weighted, depending on which segment you specialized in, we can assign a behind the border barrier to you because you are, operate in different crop segments. Some of these are multi-product firms. And we're gonna put together, manually compile all of their company accounts from 1999 to 2010. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna show you what happens to their profit margins during the same time period. And we see that there's about a 1.2 percentage, 1.2 percent increase in their, uh, in their profit margins. Next slide, please. And if you sort of wanna get a visual idea of that, this is the average profit margin across two different types of firms. The ones who were really exposed to behind the border measures, the really uh, the fat black line and the thin black line is the profit margin evolution for those who weren't very affected by the behind the border measure policy change. Next slide, please. And we see what's really happened. I'm gonna skip this. Next slide, please. So these are roughly what's, this is roughly what's going on, that if you were thinking that this policy hadn't taken place, the income losses, the income changes you would have seen from the pre-period 2000, 2004 to 2007, 2010 would have been the gray bars. But the entire distribution basically of income shifts to the left, because now we're seeing a reduction in incomes for these guys who are selling to agribusiness firms. Next slide, please. Next, thanks. So I'll stop here, which is to say, to summarize that we know that agricultural markets are really competitive for farmers. And what we might think would be that a reduction in entry barriers would help in giving farmers access to markets. But of course, this need not always be the case. And what we're finding is evidence for income losses for farmers and higher profit margins for incumbent agribusinesses, suggesting that those deep sources of market power aren't simply going to get lifted by changing agribusiness led uh, by changing to agribusiness led development. Thanks. Thank you, Swati. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for a very interesting presentation. So now, um, you know, we can uh, open the the floor for for questions and, and comments. Um, so. You know, I have uh, you know one uh, very basic uh, question, uh, which is you know what is exactly that um, dif differentiates agribusinesses from other intermediate intermediaries? So just as in terms of concrete examples, I think so, I missed that. So typically, the traders who you would be thinking of would be small traders. I mean, mm -hmm. that okay. there are many many small traders who would be interacting with these agribusinesses. They're not going to be interacting very closely in the sense that you're going to see big, you know, improvements in farm productivity. And a lot of this literature thinks that there are reasons to believe that, you know, agribusinesses could engage more with uh, farmers themselves and lead to productivity gains. In terms of the model where that shows up is that they're going to show up with a higher productive, higher ability to give you more gains from, you know, higher pro intermediation productivity but it's gonna come at the expense of you having to take some, fi some fixed investment costs and for them to be able to do that too, which is what crowds out, sort of, which is where the negative effects come from. But broadly, you should be thinking of agribusinesses as providing some additional services which can't be provided by traders. Okay, so this sounds, uh, you know, in terms of the model as similar to the idea that, you know, in, in the Melitz model, no, when exporters, enter the export market, sometimes they lose revenues because they have to pay the fixed cost of exporting. Is that, mm -hmm. the mechanism is something similar or? So, fairly similar in the mm -hmm. sense that, yes, ultimately you need the fixed and you need the cost of investments to go up. And in the Millets model, it goes up through fixed costs here to go up with fixed costs. What you're not gonna find in a Millets style model would be, those are, I mean, those tend to be typically CES models. They tend to be sort of efficient and you're not gonna be able to get sort of oligopsonistic pricing. And that's what we're, okay. we're gonna be able to connect that oligopsony pricing with those entry barriers, which are embodied in millets. Mm 
Okay, because that was, uh, you know, question. Usually the, the exporters that end up with lower, uh, you know, profits are the ones, you know, closer to the threshold, right? But the upper tail ends up with higher profits. Is that also the case in your model? I sort of anticipated that question. So I did have a slide, which I can't, I mean, I don't want to go okay. through the hassle of troubling Kirsty again. But yes, of course, the ones who sell to agribusinesses tend to be better than the average farmer that you're going to see who doesn't sell to agribusiness. But there is a whole distribution there. So yes, on average, they're better, but not there is the full distribution. And if you look at where these income losses went, it's across the distribution. It's not just the guys who were on the margin who were losing out. That margin itself has an expectation around it is what I'm saying. And that is fairly wide as well. Okay, thanks, Swati. So I'm going to um, read out some uh, questions in the, in the chat now. Perfect. Um, let me go there. I think uh, Todd yeah, I think is asking... Question. I, am, I am sort of kicking myself. I don't have a perfect answer for you here. At least in the first few years, there wasn't any entry. I can't tell you for sure about the next three years. We don't have access to data stream anymore to really go and start looking at things. So once LSE opens up, possibly. <laughs> but I, I, okay. I can't say 100% whether it didn't happen in the last few years too. But remember, okay. these are incumbent firms we're looking at. So the fact that their profit margins are going up is already quite striking. Okay, so let, let me read um, uh, Lauren's question. Uh, how does the mechanism in your paper relate to the mechanism in Machiavello and Morgiaria in which increased competition among coffee agribusinesses reduces their ability to offer inputs to farmers? So in that case, input, uh, in that case, it's more like a tied sale. In our case, it's not really a tied sale. It's, um, it happens through resource clearing in other markets. Um, so th there's also a question uh, from Richard. Richard, do you want to uh, say your question uh, or do you want me to read it? Maybe you can, it's better. Yeah, I'll actually, okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah, I'll ask, it wasn't that easy to write it. I guess it's, I mean, what you're doing is very interesting in terms of looking at how distribution changes in the face of, of reforms. But I guess just from the presentation, it wasn't so clear to me, you know, ex ante, what were the desired changes in terms of activity in the agricultural sector? What would, you know, a social planner want to do in terms of do we want more people growing this and less that or, you know, and then was that achieved? And and then there's a secondary issue about where the, the gain, how the gains were distributed. I mean, but I think we want to be very mindful of what happened to the nature of activity and whether something positive happened there separate from the distribution. And it wasn't clear to me from the presentation. Sure. Um, I don't have those results. And actually, I don't think in this version of the paper they even exist. But what, one thing we did think about looking at was how sort of what's your deviation from the potential yields that Faustat is calculating. So we could do things like those. I don't, I, I'm not gonna sort of hazard a guess of what those look like anymore since the you know, right-hand side has become much more uh, refined. So, but I, I agree with you. I think this, this is not focused enough in the sense of thinking about what was the original intention and whether the original intention of possibly shifting to high efficiency product crops was something that was sort of a desire, whether that was something that actually came out of the policy or not. So I, I totally hear you on that one. I, haven't, I don't know yet. All right, uh, Kevin, uh, do you want to uh, ask your question or uh, I read it? Did I, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so thanks, that was really interesting. I, I sort of was jumping off, I think, from a similar point as Richard in a narrower sense. I was just curious okay. sort of what's That'd happening. That would be great if you could clarify that a bit more, because I feel like there was a second component to Richard's question, which I didn't really quite follow. Yeah, so I was sort of interested in sort of, to Richard's point about like, what what would the planner sort of want to come out of this? Where where should we be headed? And so in a narrower sense, I was curious what was happening with wages in response to that. Um, and if that's something that could compensate farmers for the profit losses they're seeing. So we did look a lot at that, which is maybe it's maybe we're not picking all this up right in the sense that 
you know, consumption patterns could still be changing if there were other sort of intangibles that are going on here. It doesn't seem like that's happening at all. One thing that is moving and uh, which is that asset values that these guys own is actually going down. So, so if you think of that as, I, I don't know how you want to interpret it. You can either interpret it that that's the permanent income loss that's happened, or you could interpret it as that that's the hysteresis that's showing up and they're reacting more on that front, which I know you have work on as well. So I don't, I don't know how quite you would interpret it, but it doesn't look like wages are really sort of compensating in, in the opposite way. So consumption isn't changing as far as food and fruit and vegetables and things like that are concerned, which I think there is consumption smoothing happening on that front. Okay, there's many questions. Uh, so um, Michael uh, is asking whether uh, most uh, agribusinesses in your setting are national or local firms, or are these also international firms? Yes, I mean, really important question actually. And there are a mix of them. So there are some firms which are, there's you know, Unilever in there, there's um, British American Tobacco Company in there, but at the same time, there are other companies which you probably, I hadn't heard of them before, but they're well-known Kenyan brands, Unga and Uchumi. So these, it's a mix of the two. And in that sense, you know, possibly there's some, there's even more variation there than we're really exploring in terms of domestic versus foreign. Um. Uh, Julieta is asking if you know what happens to prices and quantities for other crops. So everything I've been showing you is at the income, is at the household level, which means we've aggregated across crops for the reason that there might be substitution going on within, sort of within the household, but across different crops. And there does seem to be, these are farmers who do multi-crop quite, quite substantially. So in that sense, everything I was showing you was at the income at the household level, but then there were a couple of regressions in there, which I know how fast I went, so you probably didn't catch on, but those were the within household crop level. And you see similar sorts of income effects going on there too. If you try and break it apart into prices versus, you know, into probability of growing into prices and quantities, those numbers tend to move around a little bit, but broadly uh, you see a negative on prices and a little bit of all over the place on growing. Right, and finally, uh, Eric has a question about the model. It says, I missed something about the model. I thought somehow oligopsony power for agribusinesses was going up, but you said there was increased entry for agribusinesses. Is the claim still that oligopsony power has gone up? What is the evidence for that? So I think the profit margins are probably the most important piece of evidence there, but in terms of, I see what you're saying, which is in the model where, what are the two conflicting forces? So in the, mo I went over this fairly quickly, but you have to kind of take a stance on which kind of fixed, which kind of entry barrier is the government reducing? And that will change what you think of in terms of which prices are going to be affected, whether it's going to be prices that you receive directly from agribusinesses, whether it's the intermediation prices, which are common across different intermediaries as well as agribusinesses. And depending on what stance you take on which kind of entry barrier is going to get reduced, you're going to see differences in terms of prices as well as in terms of which farmers are going to be affected how. Broadly, the only ones who we can say consistently something for are the ones who continue to sell to agribusinesses and they're also sort of the easiest to take to the data. But I'm, I'm sort of with you in terms of that, of course, there's entry and exit happening as well. Okay, and the final question is from Joe. Um, he says, perhaps this was Richard's question, but can we understand your regression results as saying anything about absolute income levels or just relative incomes across groups? Um, if you wanted to, as many macroeconomists would do, if you wanted to take the coefficient on the time coefficient seriously and think of that as being what the policy impacts would be, then you would still get a negative on average. So in that sense, yes, it's even in absolute terms, you're seeing, let me actually qualify that statement a little bit more. There's a whole shift of the distribution that's happening and that's true sort of more broadly. It's small, but you will still get a small negative there. 